on the podcast with us today is James Kandasamy. James, welcome to the pod- podcast. Hey, Dan. Uh, happy to be back on your podcast. Well, I'm, I'm glad to have you back here as well. And we're mm-hmm. going to be talking about a deal which is called University Cove Apartments, 263 units out of San Antonio, Texas. When did you close that deal? This, we closed on November 9th. So November 9th, 2020. 2020, so it, yes. it, it should hopefully be fresh in your mind. And Absolutely. so we're going to dive deep into this deal. But for Absolutely. those listeners who maybe have never heard of you before, why don't you share with them a little bit about yourself and your background and, and where you are right now as far as the multifamily side of things is concerned? Sure, sure. So I'm from Austin, Texas. We focus in San Antonio and Austin. We are a vertically integrated company. Uh, right now, we own like 10 apartment complex, uh, 2,000 units. And... We are single GP on uh, all our deals, right? So uh, we raise money and we do property management, we do asset management all in-house, including construction management. Um, so where I am, I mean, that this is, that's where I am. I'm right now at 2,000 units and we are looking for more opportunities as we move along. What was your background prior to multifamily? Uh, so I'm an electrical engineer with the, you know, I got my MBA as well, but and uh, right now I have a CCIM, but you know it doesn't matter so much on the CCIM side. But basically, you know, electrical engineering with MBA, what make me think, uh, you know, with a lot of uh, numbers. Sure, sure. <laughs> you gotta gotta love the numbers as an engineer, right? Absolutely, absolutely. It's numbers and you know modeling in Excel, right? And um, don't get me wrong, Excel is good. I mean, everybody does underwriting in Excel, but Excel is not everything, right? What we are doing is actually be modeling human behavior, residents' behavior on Excel. So if you forget that part, you'll be just a numbers guy. And there are a lot of numbers guy who's trying to do sponsors and syndication right now. But I think if you think about it in a different way, where we actually modeling residents' behavior in an Excel, then your whole business plan comes out live in Excel. And if you can explain that Excel to any investors out there, you know that's where it makes the most sense for a lot of investors. Well, let's go ahead and dive right into this property. Again, it's 263 mm-hmm. units out of San Antonio, Texas called University Cove Apartments. Mm-hmm. How did you find this deal? So we found this deal through a broker, but it's very interesting. This is an off-market deal. Um, and the broker called me today, let's say assume today. They called me today. They said, this is, uh, this is the price. This is the deal. And tomorrow I drove by, I mean, without the broker. And the next day we put it under contract. So we only took three days to put it under contract. Wow, that's fast. I think that's probably the fastest that I've seen or heard about on the podcast here. So uh, you, you, you heard about the deal today. You drove it yet the next day. And then the next day you put it under contract. Yes. And I drew it myself. I just drove around the property done. Let's put it under contract because it was such a good deal. Now, being off market, mm-hmm. did it come through a broker or was it direct to seller? It came through a broker, but you know, there were so many brokers going after this deal because this is a deal which was under forbearance and we cured it at closing, but it was a forbearance. So all the brokers in the nation calling all these forbearance guys. And, you know, um, so, you know, uh, we moved on it quickly because we know the value of the deal. We know the location very well. We know how to estimate rehab very quickly, you know, because we are, you know, vertically integrated operators, right? So, um, yeah, we were able to move quickly on it, uh, even though there's many brokers on it. Uh, but, you know, uh, it did come through a broker who gave us the, uh, the, uh, the tip of it. So this was in forbearance because of the, out, the, the impact of COVID? Yes, because of impact of COVID, yes. I mean, the owners has owned it for more than 20 years. So wow. it's a long-term ownership. So they already refi and they already probably bought it at five a door or 10 a door, right? So <laughs> so they bought it really, really cheap, right? So they already made all their money, right? But I think it's because it has a long-term ownership and there was distress in the property because of forbearance. I mean, you know, right? Once you're in forbearance, you know, you really can't evict anyone. You really can't charge anything. So a lot of residents were not paying. So it was basically negative cash flowing on day one. So, you know, um, so, you know, you need someone who is willing to take that risk, uh, knows the location, knows the operation to go in and, uh, you know, buy this type of deal. Uh, and, and since, as I said, uh, we were able to do it quickly because we know the operation side very well. We, we did have a good plan to turn on the property and, uh, you know, cure the negative cash flow. Um, and so we just moved on it uh, quickly. 
So on this particular deal, were mm-hmm. you able to move Flippy on, on it as well? Because maybe you had some other assets that were surrounding this property or was this kind of the first one in this, in this general vicinity? We have like four properties nearby, right? So um, we know the area pretty well. And in fact, this property is located in a much better location than any other property in my portfolio. What was the purchase price on this one? This was at 61 a dollar which is like 20,000 per door discount on the day. Well, one that, that was what I was going to ask you is, is that how much of a discount did you get this off it's, of what you It's like done? probably like 30% discount. Okay. So the purchase price on this one was just, just north of 16 million. Yes. Correct. Okay. And the, the discount was 20, around 20,000 a door. And huh? so, so if, if this was a fully stabilized deal, no, no, not in forbearance. They were going to just gonna put it on the market. They would have been able to get twenty thousand dollars more a door. More than twenty thousand dollars. More than yeah. twenty thousand dollars. I think they would have been getting almost like a, a twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars per door if it's a stabilized deal, right? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so what was the occupancy physical first on this property? Physical was eighty-five. Uh, I think uh, the collection was like almost like seventy percent right now, uh-huh. so thirty percent delinquency. And uh, there was quite a number of residents with high uh, delinquency, right? As I said, when you're in forbearance, you know, you have to figure out how to, you know, you can't really collect anything. So there were a lot of residents which is not paying any rent for, you know, three to six months, right? So you need, you need to have the stomach to buy these kind of deals. Yeah, not, yeah. Not for everyone. So. <laughs> I definitely say so. So is this a C-class property kind of middle of the road? No, this C-class? is a B-class property. As I said, this is one of the best location in San Antonio. The average median household income is like 61000 uh, you know, on that area within one mile. It's in a really good location. It's just beside the highway. You know, the property, the exterior looks really good. There's really nothing to do on the exterior. And so Did you have to put any uh, hard money up or earnest money deposit or anything like that on this one? No. No, so were there million. anybody else? Was there anybody else offering on it, or was it just yes, you yes? There were quite a number of people offering. Not, I mean, so let me cl- take that back. So everybody look looking at it, but you know how fast you move is is the challenge here, right? So immediately after I put it under contract, uh, there was another contract which came in one hour later. Uh, I, I don't know what was the price, but there was another group in New York came in with a contract. So I already put it under contract, so we are done. So there was then when I tell everyone we got the deal then everybody said yeah we looked at it too we looked at it too so uh, there's a lot of people who looked at it because there's (laughs) a lot of broker but who moved on it fast that's the most important right so so when i saw the price i was skeptical when i look at the area uh i said this is a really good area when i look at the rent rule is all in the excel spreadsheet with uh, you know if the scan copy there's no real numbers you can't you can't even see the num you can't even see the numbers on the rent rule so i know this is a 25 year old or 20 years old ownership kind of thing because that's they are the only people who will have that kind of uh, scan copy right so so I, and all this indicates to a really really good upside like long they're using third party management no, no, we we are vertically. Oh, they were doing third party. Yes, they were doing third party management. But the issue with them is they were they are they are they were used to manage like twenty units, thirty units. Okay. Right, and the owner is part of the ownership as well. The the third party management company is part of the ownership. So, so that's the trick, right? Sometimes you can have uh, your own uh, third party guys having a GP shape, but if they're doing bad, you can't really fire them because they are part of the GP, right? So, you know, it's a, it's a pro and con in having that, uh, you know, property management company as part of the GP, right? So, um, yeah, it's third party, but they are not an experienced uh, third party uh, in, in a bigger units count, right? They probably manage like 20, 30 units. Now, obviously you have a little bit of, of, of insider knowledge on this particular market on mm-hmm. and, and what you can perform this asset at, mm-hmm. but what was it that really stood out to you about this property where you looked at it and you were like, I think we can perform this better than the people who are performing it now? Just the rents. The rent was so low, right? In fact, the market rent was lower by $150 than the actual rent. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that was completely a management issue, right? So, when I, when I, when I look at the, all the market rent, that's like, hey, how come all the market rent is like $100, $150 lower, right? So, so either they didn't update the market rent or they just distressed or they just, you know, completely mismanaged, right? And um, 
yeah, the asset, there's nothing really on the exterior. There's, other than tree trimming, there's nothing really to do. It's all have new exterior, uh, new uh, new siding, new roof. Uh, there is no foundation issues. Uh, you know, there is no uh, plumbing issues since it's a more of a B-class, right? Um, so, you know, there's nothing really distressed about the property other than just management. Hmm. So that was very interesting for us. And we are getting it a really good price and a really good location. So there's nothing. So that's why I say when I drove by, when I drove by, when I coming back from San Antonio to my hometown, Austin, I called the broker, put it under contract today. <laughs> and they were like, hey, James, we haven't seen the property. I said, you don't have to see it. You know, I'm going to just put it under contract. And the funny thing is the broker went back like after two weeks, he said, hey, I'm going to go and visit San Antonio for something else. And he called me after he visited James. There's nothing really wrong on this property. This looks much, much better than a lot of things that I sell. So yeah, that's of course, that's why, that's why I asked you to put it under contract <laughs> immediately. <right? laughs> so, I mean, it's not like I got a deal that nobody else knows, right? I mean, I've done that kind of deals right, where I do direct letter to marketing. This deal was known to quite a number of brokers. Um, but, who's willing to move on it quickly and who's willing to take that chance of, you know, negative cash flow. Yeah, no, so, it's, that's definitely a, a, a gulp that a lot of people can't, you know, swallow and myself included. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, unless you are used to doing deep value add, you're used to doing a turnaround, um, you know, then you, then you do not want to touch this kind of deals. Right. But this is the value that, you know, uh, that operators like, me come in and we, we like to do this kind of deal, but this is not for deal for everyone, right? But, but uh, you know, moving forward for the past two months, two, three months, we are breaking even right now. That's which awesome. Is good. That's have awesome. You been able to, have you been able to increase the occupancy? Uh, not yet. It, the occupancy as expected is dropping, which is okay. That's what I expected. And I told all my investors, it's going to drop from 85 to 70 something. So we are like at 78% right now after uh, two months. Yeah. Or three months, right? So, which is okay. That's what I expected. But we did get like 14 leases at a $150 bum. So, we, we, so our performa is proven and we know there's a, there's a demand in that area. That's one of the really good locations. So, now we are focusing on, now since this is January, right? We bought it in winter and we know winter is going to go down. That's okay. But now it's January. Now we are going to start pushing the uh, rents up. It's probably take another six months to recover to above 90. But you know what? After 90, that sixty-one thousand a door is going to be at ninety a door in six mm. months, right? So that's the, you know, that's the challenge in doing this kind of deals. With the, with such a a delta between mm -hmm. the in place rents and mm -hmm. the market rents of what you can achieve, that mm -hmm. that hundred hundred fifty dollar a month uh, delta mm -hmm. there. What's the plan for any interior renovations, if any? Yeah, the 150 is including what we are doing on the interior, right? So we are doing okay. all the interior, new fixtures, new flooring. We are remodeling the interiors, but we're also being very careful not to drop the occupancy because we do not want to drop income coming from people already paying, right? So, and also we are hoping this COVID relief that's coming from the government uh, can recover some of the money that people didn't pay. So we're trying to keep the people who didn't pay as long as possible. It's reverse psychology nowadays, right? So we don't want to evict them, <laughs> keep them as it is until we get this money coming from the government so we can get them paid, caught out. And I know for the next three months, hopefully we can get money as well. So we're trying to get that money as well. So um, so we're definitely doing interior renovation, trying to upgrade it because it's in a good location and the rent bump can support it. Uh, but it's just so relieving to to know that whatever we expected on Proforma is actually being proven right now for that area and that asset. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. So, are there are there other assets that are surrounding this that have done a similar kind of you know a, a light renovation, if you will, to kind of increase the rents to that level? Yeah, yeah, we did uh, we did our market rentcom. Um, yeah, there's a lot of other assets who has uh, successfully you know, achieved that rent bump. Uh, not their rent bump. They, I mean, they had a higher rent, and we are just catching back up to them. Mm -hmm. uh, they still got a lot more upside. We didn't push it until the end, but we are, you know, we are being very careful on how much we want to push at this stage, right? Because we just take over. You know, it came out from forbearance, so we want to do it slowly, so it doesn't give a shock to the entire community, right? You know, they didn't pay for past six, seven months. No late fee. Suddenly, there's you know, there's a new sheriff in town asking them to pay, and you know, <laughs> it's, it's a very tricky, delicate situation on how do you manage that whole transition. Now, let me ask you this question. So, mm -hmm. when, I, when I look at this deal, and obviously mm -hmm. it's sixty-one a door, my, my I immediately look think of it as a C-class asset, right? 
And even at 90 a door, I would say it's probably more of a C-class asset. Um, again, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not too familiar with all the different pockets around San Antonio or anything like that. And obviously you do, but uh, well, what would you say about that, that this particular asset being a, a true kind of B-class asset uh, given the price of the, of the, of the per unit? Yeah, we kind of look at the price per unit because we got it a really, really good price, right? So this is a loan assumption, mm-hmm. right? At 61 a door, this is a loan assumption, but the trick nowadays is to buy deals, low basis loan assumption deal because people who are stuck in forbearance or you know stuck due to COVID, and a lot of them are selling it at, uh, you know if they want to sell, they have to sell it at lower price because there's penalty on it, right? Especially when they have agency loan on it, right? So the trick is to look for low basis loan assumption deals nowadays. Right. If you go and buy a normal debt and all that, you can't get it at 61 a door. You know, mm-hmm. this deal is going to go to 85 a door, even though it's at distress. Right. Uh, because you're new debt, you're getting in the IOs, you're getting low interest rates and all that. But, you know, B class nowadays, it's just, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's going almost at 100 a door in San Antonio right now. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And let's, let's, let's talk about this loan assumption as well, because mm-hmm. again, th- mm-hmm. we've talked about different loan assumptions on the podcast before, but I think this is actually our first loan assumption due to a forbearance because of COVID, right? Um, so walk us through that process. Yeah, this, uh, that's what makes this uh, case study special, right? So the loan assumption on forbearance. So when I got this deal, I told the, um, the seller as part of our LOI that the loan forbearance need to be cured at when I assume the loan. So, which means uh, I reviewed all their loan forbearance documents. It's a very straightforward loan forbearance. You know, they have to pay, you know, like uh, they got like three or four months of not paying any mortgage. And after that, that amount of three or four months is tacked on to the next 12 months of payment. And during this, until you pay this whole thing off, you can't get any, uh, you can't do any eviction, can't do any late fees to the resident, right? So, but if you pay off the entire amount during this process, then you're out from forbearance. So, so as part of my LOI, I told them you have to get out of forbearance at closing because I want to have that flexibility to go on evict person, charge late fee and, you know, give that shock to the system. Right. Um, so that's part of the LOI, right. Uh, so, and I, and, and um, I talked to the bank before we go under contract. I mean, if, after we go under contract, because there's no day one hard money, right? which is which is rare. I mean, it's not a normal thing in in Texas at all. Okay, nowadays yeah. all deals needs hard money, right? So I think that seems to be a nationwide thing, right? Uh, unless you probably go, you know, some other smaller cities or what, right? Um, but I was able to negotiate right, because of our track record and we were able to move on it quickly. Um, so so what I did was I called the bank and I said that, hey, I'm going to assume the loan. Uh, is there any restrictions on uh, getting this out of forbearance? They said, no, as long as they pay it off, you can assume the loan. And the bank also interviewed me because they don't simply let you do a loan assumption, you know, on a, this kind of harder deal because you may take it worse, right? <laughs> you make it, take it to the ground, right? <laughs> uh, at 85%, this guy take away and become like 60, 50%, right? So they, 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 I mean, they basically did research on me, right? Is this a true guy? Is this an operator? What, what? So when I, when they, when I call them, they were like already, oh, we are so happy you are coming on board. <laughs> they were like, they were like, first of all, they, they said, uh, we don't see any issue with the asset. Did you see any issues? I said, no, I didn't see any issue. Okay, so we all are in line. So the bank basically <laughs> called me and make sure that the expectation of the asset performance is same as my expectation. So we all are in line. So they are. They were really worried because the way the current, the previous seller was handling it was really, really bad. And you know they could not figure out why, right? And, uh, and Fannie and Freddie is giving them pressure as well. These are, these are dust, dust lender, right? This is a Fannie loan. So they were under pressure as well to make sure that they're able to recover the loan, right? Um, so they were happy when I'm, I came in into the picture and they know our track record uh, and they looked at looks, looked us up and uh, they were happy that we are taking over. So, so basically when we assume, we, we said we're going to cure the forbearance. So when we take over, the seller paid off everything um, and, and got it out of forbearance. When I took it off, um, yeah, we start with a clean slate, even though at a lower occupancy. So when you cured the forbearance, it allowed mm-hmm. you to kind of be able to get back to a normal debt service and normal, you know, being able to collect, you know, the the, the late fees and things like that from the residents. Yes, yes. Um, mm-hmm. One trick, one trick that I just want to make sure I mentioned that. So sure. the bank did ask me for reserve, which is not common in uh, assumption, right? But they said because of the asset, uh, you know, is performing uh, not good. They said they wanted uh, six months of reserves. 
And was that, was the, was the, was the, is the, was the loan or is the loans um, when you took it over already in the principal and interest payment period, or was it still in some IO period? No, no IO. It was completely. No so I'm assuming, yeah, that's another thing. I'm assuming without uh, IO period, I'm just having both principal and interest being continuous to amortize at that time. But it should be okay because you're buying it at such a, such a low basis. <laughs> correct, 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 correct. It's yeah, I mean, correct. once I bring it up to 90%, my DSCR will be at 2x. Yeah. How, how, how far into the loan are you right now? Because you assumed it, like as far as how many years? Uh, we got another seven more years to go. Yeah, seven more years. Was it a 10-year term? It was a 12-year term. So they had like another four years on their belt. And I think 2016 is when they got that loan. And we have another seven more years. So when I did my projections and all that, I put a seven-year plan on it. Uh, on, three, on third year, my plan is to do a supplemental and refinance uh, most of the money out. And what was the uh, interest rate? Like four and a half, five? Yeah, 4.6 something. Yeah. I pegged it. I pegged it there, James. Yeah. 4.6%. <laughs> That's probably what it was back in 2016. So uh, about 4.6%. And uh, it's still a really good interest rate. Oh, yeah. yeah it's, it's definitely nothing to, nothing to balk at, especially, mm -hmm. again, it's, you have to still have to go balance it with the basis of the property, right? Correct. I mean, buying at such a low basis, you're willing to pay. 4.6%, even though right now in the current environment, you can get it at 2.6% or whatever, absolutely, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's all about, the, yeah, that's why I'm saying low basis loan assumption. That's the name of the game. Yeah. You, yeah. Can't, you can't assume a deal on a normal price. Yeah. Then you are, that, no point of doing a loan assumption or no, you're not really doing a good value add, right? Uh, you're just buying another deal out there. How long did they want to hold on to that six month reserve? Uh, until I hit uh, like 165 net rental income. Okay. All right. So once I prove a uh, 165,000 net rental income for three months, then they're going to release that money to me. You hope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they have to, that's part of the agreement that I signed with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I mean, as I said, at that time, my DSCR will be almost two X, right? I mean, which bank give a DSCR of 200%, right? Most sure, of the time sure. it's 1.25, okay. right? Yeah. What kind of prepayment penalties did they have on it? Uh, it's the normal yield maintenance. Okay, just yield maintenance. Which, yeah, but, I, but I'm assuming we're going to go until the end, right? So it's the next seven years. Yeah. But even, even if you refinanced it right now, you can get a lower interest rate and still do pretty well. Obviously, it'd be harder to get any more debt on it right now the way the current you know, occupancy correct, is. But correct, if you correct. can get that above 90% in the next six months, I mean, you can refinance and get some pretty low debt. Absolutely. absolutely. I mean, that's an option. Right, you have to count and see how much is your prepayment penalty versus getting new debt. How much? You're get. So, but right now the plan is to continue hold on to the property uh, because we got it on such a good basis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the four point six. You know, it makes sense once you get the DSCR and and when I refi, I'm not I'm not planning to refi the entire value out of it because then your DSCR mm -hmm. goes up, right? Then you're very tight mm -hmm. already. So, um, but I'm planning to. I mean, the current plan is to you know do a supplemental and keep it until we, yeah. the loan runs out. Now, I know you mentioned early on that there wasn't uh, a, a lot of deferred maintenance and a lot of mm -hmm. you know, issues externally or even you know on the internal part of the units. Still going to do some renovations to kind of get them up to that 150 rent bump. But was there anything else that came up came up during the due diligence process that uh, may be interesting to talk about? That is what's surprising. We didn't find anything else, right? Other than the tree trimming and uh, you know the bad reviews of the previous management, uh, yeah, this is one deal where I could not find anything else. And it's proven to be correct because we already closed it after three months. We didn't see anything new that we didn't catch during due That's good. <laughs> yeah, it's like, wow. That's like, now it's just a management play, right? So uh, yeah, we were. I'm, I was very, very worried about that because usually long-term ownership, you know, you know, they don't, you know, they defer, do a lot of deferred maintenance. Uh, they hide things and, but, but, uh, but, you know, the good thing is this is just a pure, management issue. They just, you know, let go of that whole management when COVID hits and it just you know, going down. And since they already made so much of money on the deal, they said, okay, let's, let's forget about it and move on. And, and I think the other thing was on the seller is like, maybe they were worried about this 1031 exchange going away. Right. I mean, they, I mean, as I said, they have owned it for like 20, 25 years. They made so much of, you know, they have to pay a lot of tax if they just sell it without a 1031 with the new administration saying that they might take off the 1031 away. Maybe they were worried about that because they did a 1031 for this deal. Yeah. 
No, that's good. Um, let's talk about the, the investor side of things a little bit here. How much equity did you end up raising on this deal? Uh, seven and a half million. Seven and a half million. And mm -hmm. what kind of, how did you structure it with investors? So we structure, I call it, I mean, I, I think you are familiar with this. It's called the, uh, you know, the preferred, preferred return of 10%. I call it A1, A2. A1 is 10% flat. They don't participate in the upside. The A2 is basically 8% uh, pref with 70-30 split. Um, but once you hit the equity multiple of 2x, which is something new in the industry, then uh, you go to 50-50. Okay. Right. So more than 2x, uh, it goes to 50-50 split. And I also had another uh, structure, which is something that I, I tried it out at this time. And it was, it was interesting to see how it played out. It's called the A3, which I structured it for fund to fund. Uh, where we give a 9% prep, 70-30 split, and more than 2x, uh, it goes to 50-50. So that was very interesting because, and, but the minimum was 500,000 mm. on the third one. So that's more for fun to fun or big LLC or you know people with the, you know, a lot of money, you know, kind of mm -hmm. thing. And it was interesting to see how that you know, three uh, structured played out. So it was a 9% prep on that, on that, on, that, mm -hmm. on that share. Yes, correct, correct, correct. So 9% per and then a, once it got to two X multiple, when it's still split 50, 50. Correct. 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 Now, Are you familiar with that? I've actually never seen that slice before. So that's actually something <laughs> new too. I, yeah. I, I, I've seen the different, you know, structures as far as the different waterfalls down the line, whether it be a two X multiple or an IRR hurdle or some other type oh. of, you know, a hurdle down the line there in the waterfall. But uh, mm -hmm. That's definitely an interesting extra slice in the share. Now, one yeah, question yeah. though is, is that obviously mm -hmm. you have different prefs there in those different shares and the different prefs would actually cause the, the overall returns to change for each one of these investors uh, based mm -hmm. on the amounts that are in each one of these levels of shares. So mm -hmm. how do you determine ahead of time which, how much you're going to uh, carve out for each one of these different shares? So we left it open. So, but the thing is the first A1, the 10% prep, we only limit to maximum 10%. And uh, the second one was the remain second, the A2 and A3 was the remaining 90%, right? So okay. we left it open on how much, whichever be getting funded, which primarily become A2, right? The 70, 30, because a lot of people like to go into that space, you know, the minimum of 50 to 100,000, right? What we targeted on. So lot, almost 95% of the people went to that, right? There was a small number of people who went to that 10% because, um, it, because the way that I show the performer year two itself, you're already hitting 8%, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people didn't want to do the 10%, you know, flat, right? Unless the cash flow is like on the A2 is like 5%, 5%, 5%, 6%, then maybe the A1, a lot of people would have taken it. But the interesting part is because year two is already hitting 8%. So, you know, there was a small number of people who did the A1. Um, whereas A3 was very interesting. As I said, I put it out there to really see how do people react. Because there's a lot of money raises out there. There's a lot of people who want an equity raise and, you know, uh, but, you know, you can't put them into a GP because they're just money raises, right? So I said, okay, you can create a fund and do a fund-to-fund -fund model. I mean, mm -hmm. and so I put that A3 and I gave them the option that you can do a fund-to-fund -fund and you, I'm going to give you 9%. That 1%, you can take it as a fund management fee, right? Mm -hmm. So that they can create a fund and they can run and they can get paid for that too. So, um there was a few groups who talked about the A3, uh, but, you know, we got funded so fast, you know, by the time they talk and decide and we already done raising the money, we raised the money and time money in 12 hours. Yeah. So when you, uh, so at the, A, the A3 share, you didn't really have anybody in there, but it was really mm -hmm. just kind of get the conversation started, maybe even team them up for future deals. Yeah. Yeah. So people now they know, okay, James may offer this. So, you know, we can be ready for the next deal. Right. But mm -hmm. It's just interesting. I mean, in fact, it was a lot of interesting for a lot of people when they see it. They say, oh, maybe I can get my family to be, you know, investing in this, right? I can create a fund, 500,000, and, and uh, you know, they can do that too. So interesting. Yeah. Now on the A1 and A2 share classes, did you have different minimums of investment in those? Yeah, the A1, I, we said minimum is 100. Uh, the A2 was minimum 50, even though we said preferred is 100,000. Okay. Have you considered raising your minimum even for those A2 shares to 75 or 100 instead of keeping it at 50? Yeah, we kept it at 50. 
I know you kept it at 50. I'm saying, but have you thought about the, the idea of maybe increasing that on future? Oh, it um, it's always at 75. No, not really. Not really. I think 50 is where there's some kind of threshold of people, you know, especially new investors, right? New investors, sometimes they say, I do not know about this guy or I didn't know about this indication type. I said, but I don't mind giving 50, mm-hmm. right? 100 probably people don't want to people have that hesitation, but I've seen that 50 is okay number for people to try it out. So I want to put at 50 so that I can, uh, you know, give that, you know, the, the, the get over that mindset of, you know, uh, it's too much kind of thing. So yeah. I, I just put it 50 and, and I like to give 50 so that I can have a lot more people joining in because we also, whenever we raise money, we also want to give as many people to invest right? Uh, as possible, because sometimes a lot of people want to try out mm-hmm. and when we do well, they're going to recommend people, right? So it's more of a growing the investor base as well. How many investors did you end up having on this one? Uh, probably 106. Around 106 now. investors. Mm-hmm. And, and that was, that's what by design. I mean, I could have closed this out, you know, with a smaller number of investors because, uh, but I, as I said, I like to get that 50 and I like to give new people, you know, opportunities, right? Because, and as I said, a lot of people want to try out syndication, but, you know, they don't want to put huge amount of money in. Sure. And that's the model. Well, that definitely makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so that the average investment was basically roughly around that, that $75,000 mark. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Average, yeah. Um, yeah. Average investment was around 75, maybe 85, right? Because there were some big players coming in with big money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that totally makes sense. Uh-huh. So any other issues that maybe came up on this property, whether it be good, bad, ugly, whatever, that maybe we haven't talked about yet that might be interesting for us to kind of touch on? Um, well, it's a challenging property. I mean, I'm not saying this isn't easy. This is not a, you know, it's not a, you know, yeah, James got an awesome deal and everything's good, right? <laughs> now the this work is begins. <laughs> a, this is the tough, this is a tough, tough deal. I mean, we have to go and figure out how this high delinquency, you know, we are the new sheriff in town. People are getting a shock. Hey, how come this, this prop, we used to work with this property management company who has been there forever, right? 20 years. Right? And there's a lot of long-term residents and they are like, they are like under the market, under the market, like 200, $300, right? How do you change this? Right? So it, it, it is a challenging property. I'm not saying it's, it's easy. It's not an easy money thing. Right. Uh, but this is where the fun part is. This is where the real value is being created, right? I mean, we are going to be making, we and our investors are going to be making tons of money on this deal, right? Because we're getting such a low basis, you know, but as I said, it's a lot of work. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like it's super easy. Anybody can do it kind of thing. Uh, but it's a lot of work. It's probably take another six months for us to recover if we do it very, very well, right? Um, um, so yeah, I mean, but the good thing is, we are happy that we didn't find any new surprises on the property after we close. Um, and, and my experience has been like, every time you buy this long-term ownership uh, properties, <laughs> you find a lot of surprises and that's not good, but this is good deal. So I have two final questions for you. Yeah. You may remember them from before, but uh, these two final questions are contrasting questions. And the first question is, what did you find was easiest during this entire process that maybe originally you thought was going to be a little bit more challenging? Easiest, uh, I think uh, just, the, just the due diligence on the property, right? Because, you know, we thought it's going to be a lot of things coming up because of long-term ownership, but it was, seems to be, you know, we didn't see much issues. If it was during COVID, we didn't even walk all the units. We only walked the vacants and we had like 40 something unit vacant at that time. Mm-hmm. So we only walked the vacants. So, uh, but the good things we didn't, I mean, now we are under operation for like, you know, two or three months. We didn't find anything new, challenging. And then the last question is contrasting to that, which mm-hmm. is what did you find that was harder than originally expected? Uh, working with the, uh, you know, people who owned it for a long time. I mean, they were, they didn't have a, com- they didn't, I don't know, they were not even reading emails. <laughs> they wanted fax copies and everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, like, who has a fax machine anymore? <laughs> <laughs> they were like, can you send it through fax? <laughs> we are like, okay, that's awesome. I like it because there's a lot of upside. And they also sent me on a, the survey was sent on a, on a paper copy. This, this is your <laughs> survey. I said, where's the survey? I need to have it on the computer. No, 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 no. We're going to mail it to you. And I got in the mail, it was like huge paper, you know, so we have to digitize it and all that. So, 
I don't think so. It's very challenging. It's just you know something that I never had to do, right? Uh, working with owners, and uh, it was a good challenge for the uh, for the brokers as well. But you know, it's 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 all turned out to be really good at the end. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much again for coming on, James, and sharing all this information about this acquisition. How can the listeners reach out to you if they want to have further conversations with you about this acquisition, or maybe they want to join you on some of your future properties? Uh, yeah, I mean, my my website is Achieve Investment Group. Uh, Achieve is like achieving a goal, A-C-H-I-E-V-E. And my email is james at achieveinvestmentgroup.com. You know, come over if you guys want to join me on looking at my future deals. There's an invest with us button. Come and click there and, you know, look it up, right? So, um, and also if you want, and uh, now I have a, a, a website link for my uh for my book, you know, right now, I mean, my book has sold like almost 2,000 copies uh, in the past two years. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's a real book that's sold on a paid copy, not 99 cents. Okay, this is truly <laughs> Amazon price. Okay, I'm not giving 99 cents and say that 2,000 copies. <laughs> and I also give free book. I'm not counting that too, right? So I listed as top 15 book by Jim Cramer, The Street. So for 2019, right? That is awesome. That's awesome. And what's yeah. the name of the book? It's called Passive Investing in Commercial Real Estate. Even though you already know passive investing, read the book, right? It's only like, what, uh, $20 on Amazon, right? Read the book because there's so, so much information that people don't pick up when they call passive investing. I mean, people think just passive investing, just go and give money and you're done, right? There's so many things that you need to know. And I think, you know, just pick up the book. And right now I have a free copy on, uh, on my website. Uh, the website is called passiveinvestinginrealestate.com. If you go into that website, you can get it, the book for free. Uh, I think you pay like four ninety five for shipping, right? But you get the real physical book as well. So it's passiveinvestinginrealestate.com. Not passiveinvesting.com. I know that's Dan's <laughs> website. <laughs> so, uh, that, that website was got to me by my marketing person and, and it just rhymed with the book, right? So passiveinvestinginrealestate.com. In Sure. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for again for, for joining us and uh, looking forward to continue to follow you as usual, James, and, and also having you on a, on a future episode as you continue to close more deals. Absolutely. Absolutely. Happy to uh, talk to you, Dan, and your listeners. 